From mediocre acting to just straight up bad CGI, one thing I could admit is that my original predictions for this show are not the same as my thoughts now. My thoughts now are mostly just confusion. I'm confused as to why this exists. I mean, it's lost all of its humor and the things that are supposed to hit hard just don't. <laughs> Alive. Barely. Truthfully, it was a hard thing to trudge through. Episode 6, Zuko's backstory, that episode actually gave me a glimmer of hope for a second. Until the last two episodes started playing. Okay, so I have a lot of thoughts and I'll actually explain them all, but first let me outline some of this adaptation's biggest downfalls and the ways that I find them most detrimental to the overall work. Starting with the mediocre actors and their castings. Some actors are truly a good fit for their roles, like Ozai or the guard that watches over Iroh when he's captured. War pushes us to the edge. Some of us don't like what we find there. Is that your pitiful way of saying you're sorry for what you did? I wasn't talking about me. Sir. But this section has to do with a decent amount of actors that just straight up don't fit their roles. This can mean a number of things, really. Some people have way too much makeup on, and some people just can't act. I'll go more in depth later in the video though. Another big detriment to this piece is the writing. Not only do most episodes fall on their face in terms of pacing, story plots, and personal character moments, but a lot of characters are just straight up written badly, or don't have writing at all. First case, Tylian, uh, that's not May. But it really doesn't matter at all, because they hardly have any lines and they only exist to be Azula's audience. So many characters just don't get strong portrayals, and honestly, it hurts the show a lot. It makes it boring. But that's not the only reason it's so boring. I'll explain more later. Next is the terrible CGI. Now look, there are plenty of moments where the CGI looks fine. My biggest case would be the fighting scenes, which are honestly one of the best parts of this whole show. But God, when it's bad, it's bad. Obviously, most of this show is CGI, because I mean, how else are you going to show reaching mountain cities and massive ice kingdoms? But every now and then you just see it. That little bit of lighting that is obviously off, or the weird way the background doesn't move, but the foreground will. It happens more often than not, and truthfully just pales in comparison to what the original show is able to achieve through its animated illustrations. Lastly is the way it breaks the original story in ways that ultimately kill the original intent, or leave the entire meaning behind, leaving things characters do feeling mute or useless. This is a big problem when basically every character and plot is a crappy carbon copy of the original show. My biggest example is when Katara wins over the Northern Water Tribe's affection after challenging the Okay. Lastly is the way it breaks the original story in ways that ultimately- Oh my fucking god! My biggest example is when Katara wins over the Northern Water Tribe's affection after challenging the sexist rulings that had been a norm for their people. I'll explain near the end of the video what I mean, but Sokka not being a sexist is the least of my worries when it comes to character flaws. So with all of my gripes out of the way, I will say that there are certain things that the show does right. The entirety of the six episodes shows that the crew is capable of good pacing and telling an emotional story, but this is a lone case. Maybe that's because someone else storyboarded it for them, but I'll speak more about that later. Another good thing is the music. God, the music is so much better than the movie. Thank God they actually took hints from the show and actually used instruments you'd expect in these settings. But okay, now that I've given you a bigger exposition dump than the first episode did, I think it's time to move on to the origins of this project, why it exists, who made it, and ultimately why the original creators stepped back. So the original show was an animated three season long story, and that's what Netflix is trying to do just in live action instead of animation. Over a decade ago, M. Night Shyamalan tried to do this and failed in so many ways that it's been the primary mouthpiece of everyone's grievances for this newest adaptation, and I can confidently say that these two are vastly different. While one of them feels like a cop-out entirely, the other feels like an impersonation and not a very good one at that. 
These eight episodes had four different directors, two episodes each, each episode being written by around one writer, and you can seriously tell. The original show had like six directors and 10 to 16 writers, and instead of massively tasked episodes like the ones we see in Netflix's version, we had simpler plots that fleshed out the universe and especially the characters. The way things are portrayed changes so much from episode to episode and leaves episodes feeling either too crowded like Omashu and it's like six different plots, or it leaves episodes feeling boring and draggy like the seventh or first episode with so much exposition it's impossible to wonder about what any of this world may be hiding from the viewer. Because it isn't. Everything is explained through long ass flashbacks, subpar dialogue, or passing characters like Graham Graham. But who's the main force here? Well, that would be Albert Kim. I know you don't know him, I don't either, but I mean he worked on that weird Sleepy Hollow show from back in the day that my grandma watched, so he has to know what he's doing. I have orders to take you to a mental institution. Excellent. This day continues to bear gifts. Will we be sharing a cell, Lieutenant? Get in the damn car or I will shoot you. Look, it's not that I'm not a big fan of this show. I'm just not a fan of episodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is alright seven or eight so yeah so like i said earlier the original creators stepped back from the show which implies that they were working side by side with albert kim at first but that wasn't really the case quote when brian and i signed on to the project in 2018 we were hired as executive producers and showrunners d martino wrote that's supposed to mean that you get all of the sway and control over where the project is supposed to go and what it's supposed to look like Quote, in a joint announcement for the series, Netflix said that it was committed to honoring our vision for this retelling and to supporting us on creating the series, and we expressed how excited we were for the opportunity to be at helm. Unfortunately, things did not go as we hoped. We couldn't control the creative direction of the series. So, basically, what happened with the movie happened again, just on a less catastrophic level. So what, am I supposed to be sympathetic for how bad it is now that it's actually out and surprise surprise, not good? Nope, I just went back and watched the original and yep, it's really good. But my thoughts on that show are for another video that I'll probably end up making after this one. For now though, let me elaborate on the points I brought up at the beginning of the video. A lot of these actors just straight up don't fit their roles. Two big examples are Commander Zhao and Boomy. You can put as much makeup and cosmetics on someone as you want, and they may vaguely look like the character you want them to portray, but in my opinion, Zhao should be a scary and powerful man, not a sly, conniving, squeaky voiced rat who to put it bluntly doesn't seem like a threat. Well, he doesn't seem like a threat unless he's talking about some kind of scheme or ploy or until we get exposition dumped at the end and learn that he has a knife that can kill the moon spirit. Or how about Boomy? God, they did my boy Boomy dirty. Okay, so instead of being a wise old man under all of his craziness, he's just crazy. That's all. The actor portrays Boomy like a Jim Carrey character, and that's just not what Boomy is. He's supposed to be funny, not an annoyance. In the original, he annoys the Avatar and his friends, but that's because he knows Aang and he wants to mess with him. Because it's funny. That's another thing the writers decided to leave out of this piece. Comedy. In this, Boomy is more like some weird front for a wise old man that Aang just happened to know before he froze himself in ice. To finish my thoughts on Boomy, go and watch The Grinch and tell me he didn't borrow the acting style from Jim Carrey. It's not a dress, it's a kilt! Sicko! Some actors look fine though, like Katara. Too bad she can't really act. Same thing with Jet. He looks fine, but he acts like a TikTok actor. You know, like the ones you see doing a how bad actors act versus how good actors act. And the only difference is that he looks like he's trying way too hard in the second one. I originally thought the same thing for Sokka too, but as the series went on, I actually found that he was able to fit into his role pretty well, despite the writing for his character being abysmal. 
That's why I don't understand why Katara wasn't able to do the same thing. Throughout the entire season, she felt like she was just there for plot development and nothing more. Half in part from the writing, but heightened due to a bad performance overall. Go and rewatch the Jet and Katara fight scene. I thought I was disinterested in the plot before, but that scene showed me how truly disconnected the actors felt from the plot itself. There are examples of good casting and acting though, like Ozai is perfect, he's scary and has the voice to match. Unlike Zhao. Or what about Iroh? I think he does a fine job portraying the character, and while once again I think that the writing is the main reason why the actors can't excel, the scene with Iroh and the prison guard is seriously powerful, and it's solely because the two can accurately portray their characters and their roles. Watching the Katara and Jet scene, and then watching Iroh and the guard scene is like night and day. Okay, now let me talk about the writing. The storyboarding is some of the worst I have ever seen. It is a hob job of multiple different stories and plot points from several different episodes just drawn out or extremely compacted. Once again, I see myself referencing the Omashu episode. They cover seven different episodes in the hour and a half the series spends in Omashu, and every second of it is excruciating. This isn't helped by the constant referencing to things in the animated show. God, this happens so much. Why reference an event? Hell, multiple events or things per episode that happen in the animated avatar if you're just going to butcher your own portrayal of the story and not actually incorporate these references in meaningful ways. The world building is horrible. Nothing is taught with our eyes and several things that require discipline and a lesson are just handed to the avatar and other characters. Why does the Avatar know about the spirit world? And why is he able to go in and out so easily? Yet, he and no one around him know shit about the Avatar, and they need to be told everything by some one-note character like Gram Gram or Suki's mother. Or hell, better yet, just steal Zuko's notebook that has every single thing you'd ever need to know about all of the Avatars. What a neat writing trick. A fucking cop-out. My last point is heightened by having no learning curve to bending as an art form. Why does Katara learn everything there is to know about water bending by the time she reaches Omashu, yet Aang avoids bending even a trace of water, when in the original show he shows great aptitude for it? Seriously, what happened to the idea that, oh, Aang's gonna be more focused on being the Avatar and learning in this adaptation? It feels like he learns nothing throughout this entire season and his character is still the same as when he came out of the iceberg. Katara is the worst offender though. Paired with bad acting and some of the driest dialogue I have ever seen, it completely kills any kind of semblance that she had to her animated counterpart. Katara in the animated show had something to prove and made that obvious wherever she went. From the village where she tried to inspire an earthbender to when she imprisoned herself on a firebender ship just to prove her point that doing the absolute most is the only way the Avatar will be able to bring hope back to the people. This version of Katara is just deeply hurt and sympathetic. Any attempt at trying to reference the fact that she's full of herself just comes off as out of character for the way that the Netflix show is trying to portray her. The scene where Katara stands up to Paku is powerful because she's been doing it the entire show, even with Sokka and the rest of the world's sexist views. So what do you get when you take all of Katara's strong moments out and replace them with half-assed personal struggles that the characters aren't supposed to face until way later in the show? What do you get when you take all of the sexism out until the very end of the season? you get a non-impactful character moment that feels forced because the actor sucks. Same with Sokka. The problem with Sokka isn't that he's not a sexist. The problem with Sokka is that he's not full of himself. In the animated show, one of the biggest problems the Avatar crew has to face is their own ego. At times, they're supposed to feel on top of the world, while at other times, the characters are supposed to hit extreme lows and not have an answer. And that's okay but everything in the show has an answer, like a literal answer in the form of an exposition dump or an unnatural sounding conversation. It gets so tiring by the eighth episode, like the entire scene where Iroh and Zhao are talking about how Zhao's going to take over the North, that is so boring. Episode six was actually decent, not good, but decent. If the rest of the show was written in this way, I might actually say I wouldn't be disappointed to see a second season. Maybe this episode being decent was due to only having to cover three episodes in its 45 minutes, or maybe it has more to do with the fact that the original creator storyboarded it for them. Someone else wrote the dialogue, of course. This episode just feels different. The pacing works, and the exposition isn't too major. 
Sadly though, this episode is kind of a lone case in comparison to the others. A massive reason why all of these characters shifted is because the show takes out virtually all of the comedy, and with no comedy, the show loses one of its strongest aspects. Not only that, but the constant need to explain something tears from the actual story that the show needs to tell. Without the constant comedy, how is a viewer supposed to know when something serious or impactful is happening? You don't. Everything's just supposed to be some major information piece you're just expected to watch and take all in, but all is so mediocre and boring. Lastly, let me talk briefly about the CGI. The CGI is fine, but in comparison to the original show, it stands no chance. The original fight, chase, and war scenes are better in every way due to it being an animation rather than live action, and I think that's where all of my points can combine into one here. For this show to transfer to live action and still hold its magic, it needs to be funny. Let me ask you this, why would anyone care about Momo other than he's a part of the Avatar crew? Well, in the original show, it's because he's able to become a lovable character due to copious amounts of visual gags along with his usefulness. In Netflix's adaptation, I forgot Momo even existed until he got crushed by the boulder. You're supposed to feel bad for Momo here, but he hasn't done anything to become a likable character, and he really only serves as a reason for Yue to show Sokka to the healing pond. To close this section out, let me ask all you sympathizers one thing. If you really love the original show so much, then how come none of you were able to notice the insignificance of Sokka's boomerang past the one skit with Suki and the melons? The audacity to say that they were going for a more Game of Thrones audience is just laughable. You weren't going for a Game of Thrones audience. If you were, there would be blood and intense character dramas. You just wanted to use like two cuss words and have an excuse for the lack of comedy this show has. In conclusion, this show was better than the movie. It is definitely the best live action avatar that we have. I do honestly think that this has a high possibility of getting another season, but I really hope it won't. It's a far cry from what the animated show offers, and if you're just coming off of the live action show, please go and rewatch the original animated one. You'll see that we really didn't need a live action avatar, because the medium by which it was created was already perfect. I assume most of you probably won't agree with a lot of the things I had to say here, and I'm excited to see all of the nasty words exchanged in the comments section. Go and put your opinion there if you have something to say. But hey, Good job, you made it to the end of my ramblings. If you enjoyed it, make sure to drop a like. And if you didn't, drop a dislike, you loser. Also, while you're down there, there's this big red subscribe button too. Click that and the bell to see when I upload next. But with all of that out of the way, I hope you all have had an amazing day, evening, or night, whenever you're watching this. And I'll say hello to you guys in the next video. Peace out.